So thank you so much everyone for joining today. We're really excited to have our second webinar in the freshwater stewardship community. And we're featuring uh, Juno from Water Rangers. So before we get started, I'm just going to share my screen and kind of give a brief overview of what we're going to be doing today. So uh, we're going to start with introductions, just kind of who each of our organizations are and what kind of this freshwater stewardship community is. We're going to have Juno come and talk to us about the importance of water quality monitoring. There will be time for questions at the end, so if you're thinking of anything through the presentation, we just ask that you put them into the chat and Juno will go through them all at the end. And then I will finish off the presentation with a bit of housekeeping and announce our next webinar. So uh, the two people that will kind of be walking through this webinar are myself. So I'm Monica. I work at Watersheds Canada. If you have any technical problems, I'm going to be the person that you're going to want to reach out to. So you can just privately message me through Zoom. I'm also going to be the one who's following up with you later this week to give you an evaluation survey, some resources that Juno and I have created, and also a coupon code if you would like to purchase any water test kits through the Water Rangers online store. And then of course, Juno is our wonderful speaker. She is the science education coordinator at Water Rangers. And both of our emails are up on the screen. We'll also give you those in the chat towards the end if you have any questions for us. So just a bit of introductions about Watersheds Canada, what we do. So our first program that I've got on the screen here to highlight is our Love Your Lake program. So this is our shoreline stewardship program. And you know, pre-COVID on the left here is when we were able to go out in a boat and just go along a water body and assess the different properties from the water. So we're using our standardized protocol, which you can see on the right-hand side, and what we're basically trying to do is assess each property for different environmental measures and then give them a personalized property report so that they can take voluntary actions on their own property to address things maybe like invasive species presence, level of erosion, maybe there aren't a lot of native species along the shoreline. So we're giving each property owner different ways that they can actually make their property more environmentally friendly and contribute to the water quality health of their water body. Another project that we run are fish habitat enhancement projects. So we've got two different ones highlighted on here. The top left is our brush bundles project, which is about restoring in water fish habitat with woody debris. And this is really beneficial for different fish species, invertebrates, and turtles. So we work with community associations and volunteers to deploy these woody debris piles at specific spots where maybe the woody debris has been removed. And we're just trying to restore that in-water fish habitat. And then in the bottom right, we have a walleye bed that we've restored. So again, working with a community group for a historically, um, a historical walleye bed and we're just restoring that with washed river stone. One that you might have heard about from Watersheds Canada is our Natural Edge program, which is our shoreline naturalization program. And this is where we're working with individuals but also community groups and public lands to restore the shoreline habitat which is important for wildlife species but also for protecting against erosion and in contributing to the water quality, so trying to filter out nutrients before they go into the water. Finally, just some free resources that we have helped develop or are co-authored on, and we're just really a collaborative organization that works with a number of different partners and community groups to create these free resources that are available on our website, so it's watersheds.ca resources. And these vary from assessing your property, see how environmentally friendly it is, to starting a brand new shoreline planting program on your property. And we'll also be touching on a handout that Juno and I have created at the end of this webinar. So the freshwater stewardship community is still a bit new. We've just launched it this year. 
We're looking to connect individuals and waterfront communities across Canada any way we can through a digital space until we are able to see all of you in person again. So we have been hosting monthly webinars and we're also going to be launching some education resources, so lesson plans and activity books later into the summer. And this project is possible because of funding from the SM Blair Family Foundation. So before I pass it off to Juno, I just want to introduce her. So Juno is an ecologist focused on environmental justice and community-based ecosystem management. And she's aiming to help communities produce their own visions of sustainable futures. She is currently the science education coordinator and open data manager for water rangers and is based on unsurrendered Algonquin territory in the Mississippi Valley in Ontario. She holds a master's of science in natural resources sciences from McGill University and a Bachelor of Science Honours in Environment, also from McGill. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Juno. All right, well, you cut out there, but I'm assuming you passed it over to me. Uh, thank you for the great introduction, Monica. Um, as, as said, I'm Juno. Um, it's nice to see so many faces here um, in the meeting, in the Zoom. Uh, thanks so much for attending some uh, names I'm familiar with, um, a lot of new names, so that's really exciting. Um, I'm looking forward to giving you this introduction to Water Rangers um, and also give you some information to let you know how you can get started uh, with community, community water monitoring um, on your lake. So I'm going to start uh, by sharing my screen and I've got some brief slides to go through. Um, yeah, so community water quality monitoring. Uh, today, I'm going to go through how you can start taking action um, on this important issue uh, through Water Rangers. We're a nonprofit organization. So I, that, was, that was already a pretty thorough introduction um, to me, uh, but I'm an aquatic ecologist. I've got two degrees from McGill University. Um, this is me at my folks cottage on Charleston Lake, um, and I live here just outside of Carlton Place. I'm glad to see um, a representative from our Mississippi Lakes Association uh, here in the meeting as well. Um, I've got my bachelor's degree in aquatic ecology from McGill, uh, where I completed a large scale research project working with lake associations in the Rideau Valley. Um, I did that while I was working as a professional water quality tech uh, at the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority. So I have a lot of background and history working in this region and working with lake associations. So I like to think that I really understand uh, what lake associations are looking for, so it can definitely help you shape uh, a water quality monitoring program that fits your needs um, and the needs of lake associations. And then I got my master's degree working with community gardening groups in New York City. So I got a really different viewpoint of how environmental stewardship works and functions. Um, so I really, I'm really happy with my role at Water Rangers now as the education coordinator. I spend a lot of my time teaching kids, um, but a lot of my time working with uh, community stewards like yourselves um, and managing our open data programs um, and taking all these insights from my background to really help uh, create solutions uh, that fit your needs. So we do a lot at Water Rangers. We're a small organization, uh, but I think to I like to think that we act pretty big. So our main our main uh, program is that we work for testing to test water quality, uh, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we work on a lot of educational resources in schools as well as in the community uh, to just inspire broader learning about water and water quality and build awareness, um, as well as acting to protect water with other programs like um, policy initiatives, working uh, with the government at uh, the provincial and federal levels uh, to legitimize community-based water monitoring, uh, working with other organizations to make sure that data that's collected as part of our programs actually goes and feeds back into scientific research and policy action. Um, so the work that you do as part of Water Rangers is really feeding into a lot of larger projects as well as we work on a lot of cool community projects um, like supporting garbage cleanups, supporting um, Indigenous knowledge creation um, and Indigenous youth empowerment programs um, through grants and materials grants um, to make sure that these folks get the materials that they need uh, for this really important work. Uh, like I said, we're based and born in the Ottawa Valley, uh, but now our community is active in over 20 countries as well as all across Canada from BC all the way to Newfoundland uh, and in all three territories. So 
just to start, I guess some people already did this, but just to start, I always like to say, uh, just to think about where are you, Stuart, uh, and what lake is your home base? And you can share that in the chat, uh, just so we know where you guys are based. Um, and you can have an idea of what you're working towards and keep that in your head as we go through um, this presentation. Um, I know some people already shared in the chat, but if you hadn't, uh, here's your opportunity to think about that and share with the rest of us. I live on the Mississippi River, so that's that's my home base. Um, but this is the issue um, when it comes to data and water quality monitoring in Canada. It's very complicated. There's lots of people working on this, um, but Canada is essentially divided into 167 sub watersheds. So these are the units that uh, conservationists use when we're looking at these large scale pictures of what's happening in our freshwater. This graphic comes from the WWF, the World Wildlife Foundation. Um, they do a yearly watershed report card for Canada um, where we're looking at our indicator results for overall water health. As you can see, the overwhelming color on this map is gray, um, which actually isn't indicating uh, a health status at all it's indicating that they're data deficient. We don't have enough information about these watersheds uh, to be able to make good conservation decisions and assess their health. A lot of these watersheds are in the far north, but there's also a lot in the prairies around Lake Winnipeg, uh, Northern Ontario, where some of us might have cottages, um, out in Nova Scotia. So these are places where a lot of people live and work and play and fish and recreate in these waters, um, but for whatever reason, it's a variety of governance reasons. There's not enough uh, funding and energy and uh, employment going in to collecting water, uh, water quality data in these places um, professionally. When I was a water quality tech at the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority, we had a team of five and I think three trucks and we were running like 40 hours a week, usually over time in the summer. And we were only able to sample uh, 30 lakes in the Rideau Valley. Um, and there was a lot of lakes in the watershed that didn't get monitored, uh, essentially just because we didn't have the time to do it or the funding. And we were a very well-funded program um, compared to some other water quality monitoring programs. So it's really important that we fill these data gaps. Um, we have enough baseline information to understand how our waters uh, are doing, where they're at, and how they're changing moving forward so we can make the best conservation decisions possible both on a small scale, the scale of an individual lake or an individual watershed, as well as on this very large scale, um, looking at the entire country as a whole. So our goal at Water Rangers is to recruit a steward on every single lake. Um, failing that, it's be a steward in every single sub watershed, um, monitoring their waters with our Water Rangers kits. We aim to have a, a water quality sample taken once a month on the last weekend of every month. So that's kind of the ideal um, when starting up a water quality monitoring program. But if you have a kit um, and you're participating in our programs, there's really lots of space to tailor it to your needs and make sure that you're getting the information that's useful for uh, your lake and your individual lake association's decisions. Um, but the data that you feed into the larger platform once a month is really like the baseline um, for that to have an impact on these larger scale um, data collection efforts, like I mentioned in the last slide. So a lofty goal, but uh, we're really trying our best as a small team to recruit people, make it fun and accessible. Um, and I think a really great way is it, is it comes from the kits. They're really easy to use. They're affordable and accessible test kits. Um, they're all field tests. So I'm gonna go through a test kit with you guys um, in a minute. They're all field tests, so you get results instantly. You don't have to send results to the lab. Um, there's no additional costs associated with any of the tests in the kit, and it gives you a really good holistic uh, baseline data uh, for your lake. We also have an open data platform to log these results, and I'll show you that a little bit later. Also, I'm, I'm the open data manager, so that's kind of my, my domain. Um, this is a place where you can upload your data and track uh, trends on your own lake, as well as a place that you can share data with the wider community. And then we also have a ton of online resources and education, including a growing online training course um, that's getting better and better, um, videos, uh, printouts, all sorts of things that you can share this information um, with your community and learn more yourself. So this is a tester from New Brunswick, uh, and this is her testimonial 
uh, after using water rangers for a couple seasons. She notes that uh, collecting baseline data along the river is really important as they go into a community negotiation with a proposed mine uh, development that's going to sump into the river. Uh, by collecting water quality data with water rangers, um, it really gave the community a sense that they are proactively protecting the river in case the mine is approved. It also gave these folks the confidence and knowledge uh, to go into these consultations um, with the confidence they know what's going on in their river. Um, their claims are backed up by data and science, um, and it really gives them a lot of agency and legitimacy in these negotiations. It's very hard sometimes as a, as a small lake association or a small nonprofit to be negotiating or working with um, MNR uh, or any sort of uh, municipality proposed development um, because they have generally a lot more resources, a lot more money, a lot more time, a lot more equipment to collect this data. Uh, so doing water quality monitoring is a really great way uh, to legitimize yourself in these conversations and really feel a sense of confidence um, as you're moving into them, that you know what's going on with your lake and your input is, of course, invaluable. So why community water quality monitoring? It's a long, it's a long phrase, and I sometimes stumble on it, as I'm sure you've noticed. Um, the first is baseline data. So this is really important, uh, both for you and for uh, the ecologists, scientists, and policymakers that we work with at Water Rangers. So to understand potential impacts on a system, we first must understand their resting place. So this is what ecologists call a baseline. Every body of water has a unique uh, balance uh, of baselines. So for every parameter that we monitor uh, in any given lake, they're really going to be at different points and at different points in the season and even different points in the day. And this is dependent on the geology of the lake, uh, the geography of the watershed, and the vegetation community around that lake. Um, each critter and each process in our water bodies really needs a different balance. Um, but this isn't something that you can really just look up in a book or on a table unless you live on some of the very few water bodies that have been regularly monitored. Um, you really need to do this yourself and take these regular measurements to see what that baseline is uh, so we can watch it as it changes, if it changes. Second is building community connections. So water quality monitoring has kind of been this amazing thing uh, for a lot of lake associations and communities that it brings everybody together around a very concrete task and a very regular task. So at regular intervals, you're going out to specified sites on the lake, taking measurements, and it really increases your understanding and connection both to that lake and to that particular spot on the lake, um, as well as to each other, um, since you're having to work together to accomplish this task. Um, and watch the ripples. You'll see that people act and find connections in entirely new ways. We have a lot of uh, youth leaders, especially, that have participated in these programs that then raise money um, for indigenous water quality through fundraisers and walkathons. We've had youth leaders um, start garbage cleanup programs in their community. We've had lake associations grow um, and recruit more members and really take on some new and really exciting projects, um, but starting with this project of working together to monitor the lake. Um, and also preparing for change. Um, things can change very, very quickly. I think we know that uh, in this day and age. And preparing with data, as I was mentioning, is really a way to help you first notice early where there's problems happening. Um, for example, if there's a leaky septic system on the lake, you'll be able to hopefully catch it pretty quick um, and react and respond to fix that problem. Um, building your knowledge is really key to building agency in the management of your lake. So the more you know, the more you can prepare for change and make these effective management decisions as community lake managers. So these are the tests. Uh, this is our flagship Water Rangers uh, Freshwater Explorer Kit. Um, and these are the tests that we conduct through it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen because what's more interesting than a slide is me unpacking a box with you. Um, so I'm just going to stop the share. Everyone can see me again. I'm just going to switch so I can see myself. Can I do that? Awesome. Um, cool. So this is our Freshwater Explorer test kit. This is our flagship test kit that contains um, everything you would need to take a full water quality measurement. And it comes really stocked and prepared with lots of stuff. So in the front zipper here, 
you get data sheets uh, for you to keep track of all the data that you're taking. You get field guides. My field guide isn't in here at the moment, but you get field guides that explain all the different tests uh, that um, that explain all the different tests that are in the bag and how to do them, how to conduct them, and what to expect. Um, so you really don't need any experience to use the kit effectively. You can definitely, I mean, it's been done. You can give the kit to someone who has no experience water quality testing. Um, and generally with the field guide and the intuitiveness of the tools, um, it's very easy to figure out. So that's something that's awesome about these kits. Um, like I said, I work with kids a lot, um, elementary school students, and kids can get out and use these kits and take awesome, accurate scientific measurements, which is phenomenal. So opening up the bag here, I'll run you through some of the tools that we have that you get as part of this kit. First one is something that I'm sure a lot of lake stewards would be familiar with. It's a Secchi disc. Um, so this measures water clarity, um, which is a really important parameter in understanding the overall regime of a lake. To use this, we just drop it in and we look for the spot where it disappears and that marks uh, the spot where sunlight doesn't reach in the lake anymore. It comes with a measurement reel um, all set up for you. So that's a great, it's a great Secchi disc. We have a dissolved oxygen test kit, another important parameter for understanding how um, oxygenated the water is, because that's what provides for communities of life, fish, uh, macroinvertebrates, amphibians, they all need to breathe, they breathe dissolved oxygen. So it's a reference kit test tube test. So you fill one of these ampules with water, they look something like this. Um, they have blue dye in them that reacts with oxygen. So the more oxygen is in the water, the more blue the test tube turns. Um, and you compare it to this reference rack to take an estimate of where your dissolved oxygen is in your lake. Um, I'm not going to demo this one today, but if you want a demo of it, there's lots on our website, waterrangers.ca, um, or on our YouTube channel. And we do stock refills also. Um, if you ever run out, if you buy a kit and you ever run out of any of the supplies in the individual tests, um, we do sell refills. The next thing that I'm going to show you is test strips. Um, so these are really useful um, and accurate measurement uh, tools, but a lot of us has probably actually used these before um, since they are pool test strips. Um, Bonnie says the movies on YouTube are great. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, we really try our best. Um, these are just pool test strips. So I'm sure a lot of us have used these before if you've ever had a pool or worked maintaining a pool. Um, they're little color-coded pads. I don't know if you can see this very well. Little, little color-coded pads and you compare them on the back of the bottle. They will measure cl uh, chlorinity, pH, alkalinity, and total hardness all in one go. Um, I'll show you how it works here. I have a sample of melted snow <laughs> that just fell. It's snowing really hard here that I just took off my back deck. Um, and I'll show you how some of these tools work and how quickly they work. So for this one, all you have to do is dip it in the water. And give it about 20 seconds to change color. My lighting's not so good in here. I'm sorry, everyone. They start to change color, so you're able you're able to see um, these values in a very short amount of time. Obviously, in the snow, it looks like there's no chlorine. Uh, thank God, that would be a bad sign. Um, a very low pH. We're in the we're in the six point four range. Yellow um, alkalinity. We're about eighty on the color scale, and total hardness also very very low. Um, it's at zero because snow snow is pretty pure. So this is a really nice, easy test. Gives you all those parameters at once, and you get uh, 50 strips in the bottle. And again, we restock these, and they're very cheap. So this is a great one that you can continuously use. <coughs> Excuse me. We, we send you a thermometer. Um, you get this really great thermometer. It measures air or water temperature. Um, pretty straightforward. And as well as, this is the second tool I'm going to demo for you guys quickly today. Um, this is our conductivity probe. So this is a tool that measures 
the electrical conductance um, of our water, which might seem like a little bit of a strange parameter if you're not uh, well versed in so hard to get the yeah you you really have to tug to get the cap off thank you bonnie my co-presenter for today um you really have to tug um so it might seem like kind of a weird parameter if you're not well versed in water quality um the electrical conductance of the water gives us an indicator of the dissolved ions in the water so it's not actually the water molecules that conduct electricity um although we hear often that water conducts electricity it's the dissolved ions so these are the molecules in the water that have come from metals, um, that have come from salts, and other pollutants um, that get into our water, um, but also just from the geology, from rocks. So we need to know the baseline um, for each. Uh, how does this compare to salinity? I'll come back to that. Thank you, Bonnie. Sorry, I'm very, I'm easily distracted, clearly. <laughs> um, salts, metals. Uh, no, it's okay, Bonnie. You're good. Um, salts, metals. Um, and other dissolved particles in the water that actually conduct the electricity. Um, so by taking a measurement of conductivity, if we see a spike uh, from our natural baseline, for example, I measure the Mississippi outside pretty regularly. It's usually around 180 to 220 um, microsiemens per centimeter is the unit that we use. Um, but if I were to go out one day and I measured it and it was like 500, um, that would indicate that there must have been some sort of pollutant or spill upstream um, that I should be worried about. So in that case, I would probably contact uh, our local conservation authority, try to see what's going on. Um, this is also something that can spike, especially in a lake with an influx of road salts. Um, the river moves pretty quick, so it can wash these things out, but lakes are more static um, and an influx into a lake can definitely make a change in this parameter. So very simple to use. You turn it on, it does its thing. And then you just dip it in the water and it'll take that measurement for you, which is awesome. Um, it gives it to you digitally. Uh, these are really accurate probes. They only need to be um, calibrated once a year and we have instructions on how to do that. They come to you pre-calibrated so you can use it right out of the box. There's nothing you need to do. Um, and as you can see, snow has a very low conductance. If you take clean snow, very low conductance. There's not a lot of ions in it because it's fallen fresh straight from the sky. Um, this one is sitting around 69 or 70 microsiemens per centimeter, and that's much lower than we would find in a natural water body like a river or a lake, um, since those are influenced by particles coming in through the watershed, as well as coming off of the various uh, rocks and geology um, that we find at uh, the beds of our lakes. So that's conductance. So with these tools, um, you get seven water quality measurements that um, really tell you a lot about how your lake is doing, um, the, char the, character the characteristic, the natural uh, ge geographical and geological characterization of your lake system and your small watershed around your lake, um, and gives you a really good set of baseline data. Um, so you know when things are changing, uh, things are in trouble, uh, or there's something that needs to be managed. I'm gonna pop back to my PowerPoint. So you've got some options when it comes to our test kits as well. So the test kit I just showed you was our freshwater explorer test kit. That's our flagship test kit. It has everything you could need. Um, and that comes to $345 on our, on our shop. We also have a mini kit, which is just the essentials. So that's everything that you would find in the full kit, except for the Secchi disc and the dissolved oxygen kit. Um, those are the two kind of more expensive pieces and they're bulky. Um, so you can buy a more essential kit. It's a lot smaller um, and it's $125. You can also kind of build your own testing tools uh, since we sell each of these tools individually, as well as these restock packs um, for calibration and for dissolved oxygen. But you really do get the best deal to buy all the pieces together um, in one of our kits. <coughs> Excuse me. So the other service that we offer um, is a free and open data platform for mapping your water quality. So I'm the open data manager. This is something I'm, I'm pretty excited about and I spend a lot of time working on. So this is an example. This is a picture of Charbot Lake. Um, I don't know if we have anyone from Charbot Lake present, but Great Lake, Great Lake Association. Um, and this is an example of what it looks like when you put points on water rangers and insert your data 
uh, to map your water quality on your lake. So you get this really cool picture of all the sites that you monitor. And when you click one of those, um, one of those points, you'll see all the data that's been collected for that site. Charbot Lake is a really active water quality monitoring lake association. They've been doing it for years. Um, so there's lots of good back data um, on these points. And you can head over to the uh, data platform site yourself anytime and kind of check out how these look. Um, I'll give you the link. So the power of open data, it makes it really easy to understand your lake. So uh, for each observation uh, that you give, we give you an automatically generated summary of all the uh, observations that have been taken at that location. And you can begin to see these trends over time. So you can see how pH changes, especially in lakes that often changes seasonally, um, as well as water temperature obviously changes seasonally. Um, and more longer term trends in SecuDep. Um, this group measures phosphates. That's not something that's included in our kit. But you can put on other measurements, um, even if it's not something that you took with our tools. And you can also contribute beyond our data platform. So we have a very exciting partnership happening right now with DataStream. So DataStream is an initiative working to build the largest and most comprehensive uh, database of Canadian water quality pretty much ever created. Up until now, if you wanted to get water quality data, you would have to contact multiple different government organizations, get approval, get people to email them to you. They're usually in like messy, messy spreadsheets and in different formats so that it makes it really hard to work with. Trust me, I've done it. Um, data stream puts all this data in one central location. You can check them out at uh, datastream.org. Um, gathering from governments, from indigenous groups, from citizen scientists through water rangers, where we're kind of the way that they're connecting to citizen science, citizen scientists and smaller community monitors, and puts it all into one central repository with the same standardized data structure. So this is actually very revolutionary and it's very exciting um, for folks who work in data science. This is all gonna be in one place. Um, so you can also help uh, contribute to that project through water rangers, um, and you can contact me or talk to me after for more details on that, if that's something you're interested in doing. So uh, if you're ready to get started with some of this basic information I gave you today, um, I've given you a special deal, 10% off a test kit. Uh, it's a pretty good deal uh, with the code watersheds2021. Um, so if you go, I'm sure Monica will give you the link or it's on the handout, but there's a re referral link for Watersheds Canada. So if you click through that link, go to the shop and then use this uh, promo code. Not only will you get 10% off, but Watersheds Canada as the beloved partner will get also 10% of the proceeds. Um, so that's a really good deal for all of us. Um, yeah, Watersheds 2021. I believe it's on the handout, um, but you can take a screenshot of that or something uh, or contact me after and I'd be happy to remind you um, or lead you through the purchasing process. Um, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, we've got lots of time for Q&A, um, and I'm also very readily available over email um, after the presentation. So, thank you very much. Got it. All right, thank you so much, Juno. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat, and now is also the time if you haven't typed them out to uh, type them out. So the first one was Bonnie's and she was just wondering, I believe um, the difference between the salinity and the conductivity. Yeah, so great question. With the salinity, we're specifically only measuring salt, just salt. So if we measure just salt in our fresh waters, we would get pretty low results. Um, Salinity is really something you'd want to measure. Yeah, snow melt is, is sometimes important for salinity, for road salt, or you know, if you're working in salt water. Conductivity is more of a, of a larger indicator of not just salts in the water, but also metals um, or other ions that can conduct electricity. We do also sell individual uh, salinity meters and salinity refractometers um, in our store, which we often send out to folks working in uh, ocean environments, saltwater environments. We have some partners down in um, Mississippi and in Mexico um, that use these uh, on the Gulf. So, 
Wonderful. And Carrie is wondering if maybe first I'll say if you've heard of the Lake Partner Program, and if so, she's wondering how water rangers could work along with them. That's a, yeah, that's a really good question. I have heard of the Lake Partner Program because I worked alongside some Lake Partner Program volunteers um, when I was at Rideau Valley. Um, they took us out in the boats and we would do our measurements alongside each other. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I believe some of our partners may work with the Lake Partner Program, um, but there's no formal relationship there right now. But that is a really great place um, that we could be recruiting some more people and getting our kids out. Yeah. Amanda is wondering if measuring chlorine is the same as chloride. Um, ooh, I'm going back to my chemistry class knowledge. I believe chloride, um, maybe someone can correct me here if I'm wrong, but I believe chloride is a specific ion of chlorine. Um, so if you're measuring chloride, you're only measuring that um, ion, but if you're measuring total chlorine, you're measuring all the different uh, ions and variants of chlorine that may be present in a water sample. If there's any chemists in here, they might be like, that's not exactly true, but that's my understanding of it. It's too long ago for me to remember high school chemistry, awesome. so. <laughs> Uh, Wendy is wondering if you knew what part, it's, so it's not in the kit, Wendy, that measures the phosphorus, but do you know the tools that they were using to measure that? Um, I don't off the top of my head, but I believe they would have gotten a lab test. As far as it's my understanding, the best way to take nutrient measurements is to get, uh, you know, sample bottles, like a surface sample or a, a deep water sample using a Van Dorn or like a trigger bottle um, and getting that lab. Um, lab analyzed. Carrie is wondering if all the data is public. Yes, it is. All the data on the site is public and open um, and downloadable to anyone. Shirley is wondering how frequently do you recommend collecting data and if there are key times of the year to go out? Yep, yeah, great question. So our season runs from May to October, November, depending on, you know, how the season's looking, how the fall's looking, and when the ice comes. Um, we generally recommend people test once a month. So our national testing weekend is the last weekend of every month. And that's when we try to encourage everyone who participates in the program to get out and take a measurement on either the Saturday or the Sunday. So we have kind of a snapshot of what um, all these water bodies are looking like at the same time on the same day. Um, but testing more regularly than once a month is also welcome, you know, testing once a week or every two weeks, you will also see some interesting change. And I just, I missed one. Uh, Doreen from Mississippi Lakes Association was just giving a very nice endorsement of the program, seeing how they oh, were you. able to engage local schools and youth, like you were mentioning, Juno, and that mm -hmm. you are getting good data. So uh, awesome. tried and true from someone Love who hear uses it. them. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. Uh, Brian is saying that you mostly speak about monitoring lakes. They work with urban creeks and rivers in downtown and suburban Toronto, and they're wondering awesome. if there's any value for them to begin monitoring as a way to educate. Oh my God, yeah, 100%. 100%. Um, I was mostly speaking of lakes because I guess I was just under the assumption that most folks here were involved in lake associations. But yeah, certainly would be an awesome tool to monitor um, urban creeks and streams. Um, obviously, some of the measurements that you'll see will be a bit different, like the conductivity will probably be very, very high, um, maybe even up to the thousands, um, but that's kind of normal uh, for urban streams since they get a lot of sediment infill um, and runoff from surrounding environments. Um, I did my master's degree working with a lot of watershed stewards um, in New York City. Um, I worked a lot with the Bronx River Alliance. Um, Bronx River is the only freshwater river in New York City. Um, and they did a really amazing, they have a lot of really amazing community, um, community building, um, education programs, environmental stewardship programs. Um, and they do a lot of water quality monitoring. They don't use water rangers kits. Um, they could, but uh, they don't. Uh, and they do a lot of really com uh, amazing community participatory water monitoring um, and have like restored the Bronx River to be a really amazing community space. I have lots to say about them. Um, you can definitely contact me after if you want more. Uh, thoughts on urban water quality monitoring because I certainly have them. Perfect. Uh, Ken is wondering if the test packets last a full year. 
Yes, they do. Um, so I believe you get 50, I say, with a question mark in my, in my head, 50 um, dissolved oxygen ampules um, in, in the dissolved oxygen kit. So that's kind of like the limiting, the limiting piece, I guess. That's the thing you'd probably run out of the fastest. I believe you also get 50 test strips um, in the test strip bottle. Um, these should, oh, it's 30 DO vials. Thank you, Don. Um, Don's, our, Don's our superstar tester, by the way. He's the best. Um, he's been with Water Rangers longer than I have, for sure. He's laughing. Yeah, he rocks. Thanks, Don. Um, so 30 DO vials um, in the box. That's the thing you're going to run out of the fastest. Um, but if you're only taking one DO measurement per month, that's going to last you 30 months. Um, so yeah, it depends how much you use them. Um, it depends how much you use them. And even if you take a DO measurement every time you go out, or you choose to only take a DO measurement every couple of times you go out, that's kind of up to you. Um, so yeah, they'll certainly last the full year or even two. And on that note, Don was also sharing some information about the phosphorus testing. So he said that they used strips that were designed for that test similar to the ones that are in the kit. And that was to monitor agricultural runoffs. That's awesome. Yeah, those 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 tools are definitely also available. Uh, Shirley is wondering, with road salt becoming a problem, would uh, an idea be for early sampling for connectivity? Would you recommend that to see kind of the impacts of road salt? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, that's a really great one that you could probably even see the change throughout a season. So if you're monitoring conductivity regularly, let's say in a bay, um, where they do road salt around it, you'll almost definitely see a spike in conductivity as soon as we come into the road salt season um, and there's more salt going in, but you have to establish that baseline first. So you do need to take a couple measurements through the summer um, when there's no road salt to get that kind of indication of what uh, the lake sits at naturally. Um, but once the road salt starts happening, yeah, you will almost definitely see a spike and that's great. That's great data backup. Um, if you're trying to speak to the municipality about the road salting practices or trying to implement um, you know, gravel uh, or anything else. I'd, like, there's lots of different road melt options. Um, yeah, great question. You, we would absolutely see um, a change as long as you're not. I don't really see a change here on the Mississippi, for example, because the water runs so fast. Um, it it washes out a lot of these salts um, pretty quickly. So I'm not out there at the optimum time to get uh, these measurements. But in a lake, uh, those salts stick around, so you will see a change. Perfect. A couple of people are asking for the coupon code and, you know, your email and things like that. So I've just popped in the chat Juno's email and my email, but also know that everything we're talking about is going to be summarized in a handout, which you will get probably by Friday this week, as well as a recording of this. So if you want to share with other people at your school or with your group, uh, everything will be shared with you. So you know, don't worry if you haven't gotten it down on a piece of paper, we will get everything to you. And I also am going to pop in the chat a link just for a really short evaluation survey. Juno and I would really appreciate it if you could just let us know how you found this webinar, the content of it, and just help us improve for future webinars we're going to host in the freshwater stewardship community. And the last thing I think I think we got through all the questions, but the last thing that I will share is just the next webinar that is too many windows open. I will just share what the handout looks like. So you will get a copy of this as a PDF again later this week, gives you all the coupon codes, also gives a bit of an introduction to community monitoring and citizen science. So if this is a new topic for your group or other colleagues, you can share it with them and gives a bit of an introduction, gives you all the links to everything that Juno has been talking about, including that open data platform, which I believe Juno, you don't need to have a profile to see the information or do you? You don't. So if so someone also just asked in the chat, um, if we buy a kit, how long is the data program open to us? Um, so I'm just going to say this out loud so everyone hears it. Um, the data platform is open and free to everyone forever. 
Um, so you don't need to purchase a kit to use the data platform if you have water quality monitoring tools um, to take these sorts of measurements on your own. You can definitely go on there and I would encourage you to um, contribute, add in your data and use it to track your own observations. It's kind of custom designed to work well with the kits, but if you're using other tools, um, there's definitely, I encourage you to go on and make a profile and upload that data. Um, and it's free and open to everyone forever, which is a really great thing about the, the data platform. Um, Bonnie says recommend download the protocols at least. I, I, I'd agree with that. Um, definitely check out some of the protocols that we use with the kit. That's all available on waterrangers.ca to make sure that you're kind of following the same, um, the same protocol if you're not indicating that in your measurement. Someone also asked a question about DO. I'm just trying to find it. I'm sorry, Ed. Um, you purchased a DO. Just let me read it. Um, It does only, yeah, good question. Um, that's awesome that you purchased a DO meter. Um, our kit does only take a surface, um, a surface sample. So you're just taking water from the top layer of, of the lake and doing a chemical test. So essentially, I'll show you quick. You're filling one of these little test tubes with surface water. It reacts with the dye. And then you're taking an estimation um, by comparing it to this reference track. So it's, it's, it's an estimation of dissolved oxygen. They're pretty accurate and they compare well to probes. We have compared them against probes. Um, but yes, you're not taking a dissolved oxygen any further down than the surface. It's just a surface measurement. Very good question.